Well, good morning. I want to welcome you this Sunday morning to worship. This is a taste of what you will see if you come next Sunday, and so we would like to invite you, and hopefully you are inviting friends and family to come and join us for the Christmas cantata as we lead into Christmas here this next week. I have a card I would like to read this morning for you. Uh, it's from the family of Isla Kern, and it says, It was so nice to have a place for the family to gather and share a meal after Mom's funeral. Thank you for all the food, the flowers, the thoughts, the visits, and the prayers. Your kind hospitality is a true blessing to us. And so please remember to lift up the Kern family there uh, as they mourn Isla's passing, especially during uh, this holiday season. And so um, we want to get into scripture this morning. So our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 2, and I'd like to read verses 15 through 16 for us this morning. It says, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we do just come before you. And as we are getting so close here uh, to that day that we uh, take time to uh, recognize the Savior's coming, Lord, and that you would send your son here. Um, to earth, uh, to live, and to uh, be the perfect sacrifice for us, Lord. And uh, so we thank you for that. I pray that uh, this would be a season of reflection for us uh, of, of that very thing, uh, of the Savior coming for us and what that means for us uh, individually. Uh, but also we consider that here as the body of believers as well and what that call is for us as we uh, look to the vision and mission that you've placed here and uh, we pray, uh, especially for this time, that it's a time of invitation, uh, that we can uh, see our family and friends who, who need to see and know who you are, Lord, and that this would be the season of invitation for us to invite them to church uh, into the conversation uh, of who you are. And I pray that we would live that out each and every day uh, in the midst of the chaos and the hustle and the bustle of everything going on, Lord, that we would just... Um, continue to live our lives as a reflection of what you are doing uh, in them um, as we are out in the community, as we uh, spend time with family and friends here uh, in the coming days and in the weeks. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for the upcoming opportunity that we have uh, as a church as we uh, will maybe see visitors come through our doors. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just be preparing us and be preparing them as well for that very moment and that time. We thank you and we ask that you would just go before us and lead us here this morning as we worship you through songs and as we are challenged here this morning through your word, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, be encouraging us, that you would be giving us uh, clarity and direction uh, for our lives and for us as a church here today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's start off with the first Noel. Number 180. <clears throat> the first Noel, the Oh. 
joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Number 13. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of hosts. Heart unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. town of Bethlehem. <clears throat>
Before we sing, I want to kind of preface the song just a little bit. Uh, this is one of the pieces out of uh, the cantata that you'll hear next week. Uh, but I want you to think just a moment. With this song, there's a, there's, there's a very important piece in the middle of this song that I want to point out. We, we, we realize that our God is the God who created heaven and earth. He created time. Amen. And think about this. When, when, when he looked down on this earth and he saw the world turning away from him how easy it would have been for him to just say I'm done with you and cast us aside but instead let's look what his love has brought us what his love has brought him to do listen to merciful Savior. Wait. 
you guys can find these envelopes in the back of your pews. They are for the pastor's Christmas love gift. Okay? If you feel so led, make the checks out to Pastor Stephen Carter or Pastor Brian Duby. Okay? Don't make them out to the church. All right? We will be collecting them next Sunday morning, the 19th, right after the cantata. So uh, if for no other reason, you need to give so Pastor can get another coat that's brighter than that one. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you. I have to do my best to keep you awake here. So um. As we get ready this morning, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. As we get ready to pray, uh, I want to encourage you to remember Lewis Seward. Uh, Lewis and Lucille have both had uh, COVID that they've been fighting with a little bit there, but Lewis's number, oxygen numbers began to drop, and he was admitted into the hospital uh, Friday uh, there. So be praying there for Lewis, and we're praying for a quick recovery with him. And, and, so, and then... Uh, Thankfully, by the grace of God, we were spared the tornadoes here this past weekend, but I know that there were several places in Tennessee and Kentucky and the Midwest that were not, and so uh, be praying for those as well today. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come together this morning, we are grateful for what a great, merciful Savior you are, that Lord, how uh, dependent we are upon you, and God, we are grateful for the grace that you give to us. Lord, this morning as we gather together. We think of those that are not able to make it here because of illness or because of uh, other things that are able to, to keep them from out of uh, worshiping together this morning. Well, Lord, we pray that you would just be with them, that you would bless them. We think especially of Lewis and Lucille this morning, and, and Lewis especially as he is there in the hospital. Lord, we just pray that you would just strengthen him, that you would just touch and be with him and raise him back to health here again, Lord, so that we can begin uh, to fellowship and to worship with him and just to enjoy uh, each other's company and presence. Lord, Lord, we um, pray for those that are in uh, Kentucky and the Midwest, those that were touched by and impacted by this tornado. Lord, we know there was a lot of loss of life. And so, Lord, we pray for those families, that you would comfort those grieving, and that you would be with them. Lord, we pray for the uh, loss of property and the injury and illness and all that that is, goes along with that. Lord, we just pray that your presence would be known there that you would just show up and do what only you can do there. Lord, we pray for the churches that are in those areas that as they minister uh, to those families and to those peoples, that God, that you would just equip them and, and bless and be with them, and that God, that uh, even out of this tragedy and this darkness, that Lord, that you'd cause something good to come forth. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just be with us now, that you would be with us as we open up your word and we study your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2 this morning, and uh, we're going to take the opportunity to kind of, re kind of look at again the simple message of Christmas there this morning as we do that. Uh, we appreciate, and I hope that you do too, but we always enjoy the uh, Charlie Brown Christmas Carol, and it's interesting to me that as many years ago as Charles Schultz wrote that uh, little cartoon and, and uh, narrated that, that a uh, even back then, they were complaining about the commercialization of Christmas and the kind of the chaos, the busyness that often comes there with Christmas. And uh, what's ironic to me, if that was taking place back then when Charles Schultz wrote that, how much worse is it today? And so often as we come into this Christmas season, uh, there is just a kind of a busyness that comes with the Christmas season. Uh, there's Christmas parties and uh, Christmas gatherings, and the, whether it's the family or the kids, or uh, there's always something, it seems, <coughs> that we're having to do. And, and if it's not the having to do that, we need to go get finish up the Christmas shopping for the Christmas gifts. And while we're there, we begin to complain about the commercialization of Christmas. I, 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 how has it kind of gotten to this point? And so this morning, we want to take just the opportunity to kind of cut through some of the chaos, cut through some of the busyness, the commercialization of Christmas, and come back and focus in just on a simple Christmas. One of the highlights there of that Charlie Brown Christmas is when Charlie Brown has reached the frustrating point of what is Christmas all about, 
that Linus comes and he begins to quote this passage from Luke chapter 2. And so this morning we want to take the opportunity to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And it said, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph went also up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there was in the same country shepherds living out in the flock, of the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. As we come to this passage, we are reminded once again of the simple message of what Christmas is truly about. As we look at this, we realize this, that we must cut through the clutter of what Christmas has often come to be. And it's interesting because as we look at this, this is not a new problem uh, that we have to face. So this is a, a common problem. I, I, it's interesting to me as we read this Christmas story that the Christmas story is very much a human story. It's something that we deal with there on a regular basis. You begin there that story, and as you look there at that story, uh, there are some things that are just so very ordinary and human. Uh, things like taxation. Uh, that taxation was given, the decree was given that a census should be taken for the purpose of taxation. They uh, had to go back from where they were living back to their hometown so they could register together with their family and uh, family lineage so that Caesar could determine how much taxes each region should be assessed there to support the Roman Empire. And it reminds us there that oftentimes as we come into this Christmas season that one of the things that we need to do is that we need to cut through the chaos to find the simple message of Christmas. Joseph and Mary knew a lot about that chaos. It was at an inconvenient time that decree came, right? Um, Right there towards the ninth month of pregnancy uh, that was necessary for them to make the journey. And so they had to take a, a three-day journey, a 90-mile journey and, uh, there just to go back to Bethlehem. Um, it was because it was a Roman occupying force. And, and to, to think of the resentment that must have been there because of that. The, they were going to be taxes to support a government they didn't even want and like. Um, it was an inconvenient time. How often times do we get struck there with the inconvenience that things are not just uh, we, you know, we want them to, be, to fit there on our schedule. And Christmas is often comes into that time, right, where it becomes inconvenient. We've got so many things filling up the schedule and that compressed time of month of all these things that we're trying to get done. And then so much of it is inconvenient. I think I can imagine there for that couple that they were very much overwhelmed. To finally make it into Bethlehem, then to try and find a place to lodge and not being able to find room and everything being chaotic and uh, how overwhelming it must have been. And oftentimes as we come into the Christmas season, that's often what we feel and experience. We feel the overwhelming pressure of Christmas. And so sometimes we need to push aside the chaos of Christmas to come in and focus in on the simple message. Amen. But it's interesting because I think there's also, as you study the Christmas story, there's the opposite that takes place there as well, right? 
uh, there were shepherds in their flock by night. Verse 8, in the, uh, the same country, shepherds were living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And we understand there, uh, there that Middle Eastern shepherd would often take their flocks and their herds out, and they would kind of go from uh, pasture to pasture to make sure they find grazing. And uh, there they would often uh, camp overnight with their flocks to protect and watch over their flocks. And so I can imagine those shepherds have just gotten the kind of flock settled in for the evening. They've made sure that they have all the the provisions they need, the campfires going. Somebody's gotten, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of supper prepared there, and they're just kind of settling in for the evening, right? Just another regular evening for them, living out in the fields, there with their flock, nothing extraordinary, nothing pressing there that they had to do. And oftentimes what we find too, the opposite sometimes takes place and that the mundane of life can dull us to the simple message. So oftentimes we we get busy just doing the regular tasks, right? And I don't know if you ever find that problem. I know that sometimes I find the problem, I'm going somewhere, but I'm going in a path that I'm so familiar with, right? Uh, Maybe it's the way that I go to work in the morning and and I get there and I kind of just point the car in that direction and it's almost like it's automatic, it takes place and I, I... and the problem is, is that that wasn't where I was supposed to be. I'll end up at work or I'll go past the road I was supposed to go because I've, I've done it so often. I kind of just stop thinking about it. It ha- takes over by habit. Sometimes that's what we, we have heard maybe the story so many times. Or life is just kind of into that regular routine. It's what we do every week, every day. We've got that regular routine. And we've kind of been ground into that drowsy dullness there. For the shepherds, I'm sure it was just another regular evening. We finally got the sheep settled down, grab a bite to eat, tell some stories around the fire uh, there, but nothing exciting ever happens here until that night when the stars lit up and the sky shone bright And the angels broke through and the glory of God broke through. You know, don't become so familiar with this Christmas story that it becomes mundane. That it becomes regular, boring. As we focus here on the Christmas story, it's the glory of heaven breaking into earth. And when we look at this story, it ought to grasp our attention and and amaze us, to cause us to step back in awe. And so that brings us to the second point that we see here is this, is that we stand amazed at the Christmas birth. We see the what of what's taking place, right? And it's interesting because here in Matthew and here in Luke, it almost tells it almost matter-of-factly, right? Uh, and so verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Just, just kind of just, that's just what happens, right? Uh, you can see there the, the excited father of Joseph being the adoptive father there of Jesus. And the, is it time? And what do, I, what, what do we do? Uh, uh, as some of you fathers may well remember, and, and the kind of the panic that began to take place, they're being isolated and alone and separated from family. Uh, there, they're in the uh, stable there by themselves, not even room for them in the inn. And yet, what we're really amazed by is the fact of this, that God Himself would step out of eternity into time and put on human flesh. Philippians chapter 2 reminds us there of that wonderful glory, this idea that that Jesus did not cease being God, but added to His deity humanity and came to earth. And the amazing part, not just that He would add humanity to uh, His deity, but the fact that He would experience humanity as we experience humanity. He was born the same way that we were born, that the God of heaven who created all of that we see would take on the flesh of a helpless human baby that would be dependent upon his mother there for sustenance and for life. 
there in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, right? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearances of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That God would step into time. Matthew highlights the fact that his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. That, that God is for us, that not just that God is for us, but that God has come and has dwelt among us, and we have beheld the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes to reveal God to us. And as Philippians chapter 2 points out, not only does He come to reveal God to us, He comes to be the perfect sacrifice, that God would sacrifice Himself on our behalf there upon the cross. And so as we look here at this Christmas story, as we stand there at the manger and we stare at the manger, we should be amazed that God would put on human flesh. We should be amazed not only that God would put on human flesh, but that God would choose such humble beginnings. That's what Philippians chapter 2 is reminding us of there, of a humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, that, that don't think of yourself more highly than you should, but instead imitate Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came. If, if we were to write this story that God were to come to earth and God were to dwell with mankind, I, we would probably have put him in the most prominent, powerful family in the world of the time. But notice he is not in Caesar's palace. He's not in Herod's palace. Instead, he's born to a peasant family. A poor family. We know that because of the sacrifice that they offered there when they redeemed him. Uh, is there a sacrifice of those who were in poverty? He comes not only to a common family, into a common place there in Bethlehem, but he comes to be born in a stable. It, it's not even there. It's not a palace, not a home, not a hospital. But it's the stable there where the sacrifices were born. And Jesus Christ came to be born as the perfect sacrifice for us. So as we come into the Christmas story, I want to encourage you to step back once again and let your heart be filled with awe. God became man. That little babe in the manger was also the same God who spoke the world into existence, the same God who sustains and holds all things together, the same God that is worthy of all worship. He humbled Himself for us. We ought to be amazed as we look at this and we begin to look at the why. And the, the angels begin to reveal the why for us. Why would Jesus come? And so we're amazed at the what? There's the babe in the manger, but there. As the shepherds were in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night, the angelic messenger broke in. The glory of the God shone round about them and began to share the message with them. And there's two messages. There's first the message that the angel shares with the shepherd. And then there's secondly the song that is sung by the angel chorus. It says there in verse 10, right? The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Isn't it interesting? Because isn't that what what our natural response would be if you... They were there in the darkness of night, kind of just settled in for the evening, and all of a sudden uh, the light just filled the space, and the angel steps forward. I, I my natural response would probably be the heart would start racing, and I wonder what's going on. And the angel says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And you will find, uh, this will be the sign that, uh, to you that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
Why are we amazed at this event in history, this time and place? Because Jesus is the opportunity of joy for all people. I bring you good tidings of great joy. The, the message of Jesus Christ is a message of good news. It's good news for us, and it gives us here the opportunity to rejoice. Little did they know that that babe in the manger would grow up to be the man on the cross, and the man on the cross would pay the price of their sins, be buried and rose again to give them new life and salvation. And so today we can rejoice because we have the opportunity that our sin is forgiven and that we can now be reconciled to God because of this child that was born here in the manger. It is the opportunity of joy for all people. Interestingly, that Christmas time is often one of the hardest times there for emotional and mental health. Uh, it is one of the highest times of suicide and suicidal thoughts. And the tragedy of that is Jesus Christ came to bring joy. Amen. We get so wrapped up in the busyness and uh, what we uh, expect and anticipate and what it is often disappoints us that we forget that Christmas isn't about those things. No. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ came to bring us joy because we can have our sin forgiven and we can be reconciled back to God. We have the opportunity for joy. Not only do we have the opportunity of joy there this morning, what we also see is this, is that Jesus Christ came to deliver us from our sin. Verse 11, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It points us to our greatest need, and our greatest need was our sin, that our sin had separated us from God, that all of us are sinners, and that sin separates us from God, that we've chosen our sin rather than choosing God. We've rebelled against the rightful authority of God in our life, and that sin has placed us under the wrath of God, that, that we experience God's judgment against sin. That is our greatest need. Oftentimes we think, well, if I had a little bit more money or you know, I could get that next degree, if I could just uh, you know, get a house or a car, I, that's enough. Our greatest need is that our sin separates us from God. Jesus Christ came to be our Savior. Galatians chapter 4 puts it this way. It reminds us here of this good news this way in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, right? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of, a, under, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus came to be our Savior, to redeem us from our sin, so that we can be reconciled back to God. Jesus was sent forth in the world not to be an example, not to be a great moral teacher. He was sent forth into the world to be our Savior. He came to rescue us and deliver us from sin's penalty and from sin's power. Jesus is that Messiah, that anointed one. He is the Christ that is given to us to rescue and deliver us. Jesus came to deliver us. Not only did Jesus come to deliver us, but we also see this, that Jesus offers us peace with God. And suddenly there was with the angel of the multitude of the heavenly host, uh, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. It's interesting as you look at many of our Christmas carol carols, uh, many of our Christmas carols were written by Unitarian Universalists uh, there. And uh, Unitarian Universalists, if you're not familiar with your church history, were the early theological liberals that one of the things that they did is they denied the deity of Jesus Christ. And so as you look at some of those Christmas carols, one of the things they'll often emphasize, particularly here at the Christmas time, is peace. They, they like the idea of peace. They wanted uh, that idea of peace. But there's a problem that comes with that, right? It is impossible to have peace without the Prince of Peace. Our peace comes because Jesus Christ has come and brings us peace. We now have the opportunity to be at peace with God. Prior to this, we were living in rebellion to God. We were in enmity with God. 
that our sin had put us at odds with God and placed us under the wrath of God, and we uh, were not at peace. There was not peace in our hearts and our souls. There was that deep longing uh, there within us. Uh, we were not at peace with God. We were under the wrath of God. And we did not have the ability to solve that problem on our own. It wasn't just that we could just try a little bit harder, work a, a little bit more, do another good deed. We don't have that ability to solve that problem on our own. And if eternity finds us in that way, we're separated from God forever in hell. And yet Jesus Christ came to bring us peace. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us of this wonderful truth, right? For He Himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation and has abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, having put to death the enmity. And He came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through Him uh, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father, that we experience peace with God because of Jesus Christ. Notice what it said, it said, for He Himself is our peace. Our peace is made possible because of the person of Jesus Christ, because of what He has done. And our peace is dependent upon the person of Jesus Christ. So when we come here into this Christmas season and we look at the babe in the manger, we can be reminded that we now can experience peace with God. But because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, He doesn't just give us peace with God, He gives us the peace of God. In John chapter 14, He reminds us there that His gift to us is peace. In verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Here's the good news that we have, that when we are at peace with God, uh, we can enjoy the peace of God. As we come into this busy season, and even if our schedule gets hectic or the uh, budget gets tight, we can still experience peace. Amen. Peace comes because we know Jesus Christ, and we yes. have trusted and received His free gift of salvation, and we have that relationship that comes from Him. And that comes from trusting and walking with Him. Jesus Christ is our peace. And He offers peace to us. And then not only does He offer peace to us, He reveals the grace of God to us. Right? And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That idea of goodwill is that idea of grace. Jesus Christ is God's greatest gift. So oftentimes we get here in the Christmas season, we focus on the, the giving of gifts. And that's a, a, usually a large part of the, our Christmas season. And, and if you're the parent, you're usually the one involved in purchasing the gifts and uh, making sure you've got the right gift. And, and the greatest gift that was ever given won't be under a Christmas tree this year or next year. The greatest gift that was given was there in the manger that Jesus was the demonstration of God's grace towards us. He is God's grace embodied. That when we want to know and experience God's grace, as we come into that Christmas season, we wonder, uh, does God love me? Does God care? Then look at the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ demonstrates God's grace to us, that God was willing. It reminds us there, right, when we come into Genesis and God tests Abraham there, and he tests him of his faith, and he says, uh, I want you to sacrifice Isaac there upon the altar. And if you remember, as they're going up there, that uh, Isaac says, Father, I, I see the wood, and I see the fire, and I see the knife, but where's the lamb? And Abraham reveals those wonderful prophetic words that God will provide himself a lamb. The greatest demonstration of grace is that God gave his greatest possession. He gave His own Son to us to 
redeem us and reconcile us back to himself. Not only is Jesus the greatest demonstration of grace, but he gives God's grace to us. Because of his redeeming work that he goes from the cradle there to the cross and he makes possible the redeeming work upon the cross for the crucifixion and the resurrection, he now extends God's grace to us that we now can have our sin forgiven and we can be reconciled with God and we can live in that relationship with God and we can uh, live out of the grace that God gives us. And that's made possible because of Jesus Christ. So it brings us here to this challenge that I want to leave you with today. This the challenge is this, is that since Jesus Christ is God's greatest gift, have you received that gift today? It's given there as a gift of love, as a gift of grace, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't received that gift today, make today that day. Before you leave, simply acknowledge your sin and uh, by faith look to what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf and Ask Him to forgive you and to become your Savior. Receive that gift of salvation He makes available today. And then as we come into this Christmas season, hopefully one of the things that we've taken the time to do is to slow down and pause and to thank God for His grace. Say, God, thank you for Jesus Christ, this gift that was given. Don't get so wrapped up in the busyness of Christmas that you miss the main event. Amen. Jesus Christ was given for us. Amen. Let's take the opportunity to thank God for that. Lord, as we come together today, we thank you for this good news of Christmas. Lord, we have hope today because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. That He came here to earth and He took on human flesh and He became God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And yet, he went from that cradle there to the cross. And he took our sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven. He rose again so that we could experience new life. God, we have joy and peace and hope. Lord, we have God's grace because of Jesus Christ today. Thank you that you sent your son to us. And thank you for what he's done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song of invitation. If you don't know Christ as Savior, we'd love to invite you to come and trust and receive Jesus Christ as Savior today. If you do know him, let's take the opportunity to thank him. As we sing this song, the altar is open. If you want to come and pray, if there's another decision God is making, you respond as God calls you to respond together today. Give 199. Oh, come all ye faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to bed. of angels sing in exultation oh sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above glory to God all glory Adore him, oh, come, let.
that invitation is given to us, let us come and adore him. And so this Christmas season, hopefully that's what we'll do. We'll take the opportunity to slow down, to pause, and to worship Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you have revealed and given Jesus Christ to us. How unworthy we are of that wonderful gift. And yet, God, you have showered us with your grace and with your love. And we see that in the person of Jesus Christ. As we come through this Christmas season, let us not forget, but let us focus on Jesus Christ, on who he is, and upon what he has done for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You take your seats here this morning. Let me just share a couple things here with you. We're going to show a video here in just a moment as we look at this that... uh, Helps to remind us here of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. One of the things that we do here in this season is we like to take up a special offering there for Lottie Moon. And um, the envelopes are back there in the foyer as well as back uh, in the table down there. Everything that is given to, in that gift goes to support uh, missions there with the International Mission Board. And so I want to encourage you as you pray about that, uh, be asking God what part he'd have you there to play. But here's the difference that your gift makes as you give that there today. And so... Before Christ, I lived in a house with a demon. When I was growing up in a Hindu family, a demon possessed my mom every week. Hindus actually believed my mom was a goddess and they called me son of the goddess. I was 25 years old when someone shared the gospel with me and Christ changed me and my entire family. I was no longer the son of the goddess but son of the living God. As a new believer, I didn't know where to start but God called men and women into my life to disciple me, to teach me and to walk alongside me as I shared Christ with friends, family and strangers. When God called me into ministry, these men and women, these missionaries became my close friends and partners. We looked out over big cities and tiny villages, choking on false beliefs they had inherited, and we begged God to breathe life into them, and God answered. God used us and other believers to draw a harvest of dozens, hundreds, and thousands to Christ. Together with my partners, I organized these Christians into house churches, We encourage them in evangelism and we disciple them in God's word. The churches kept growing and the gospel kept going out. Dawn has come for gospel work in South Asia. Join your South Asian brothers and sisters. Join the IMB as laborers in the greatest harvest field in the world. Now is the time. Now it's your turn. We think of that passage, I know that we looked at in our Sunday school class there this morning, that those that have sat in darkness have seen a great light. Amen. I can't think of any other deeper darkness than a spiritual darkness there of idolatry, and yet God revealed the great light of the truth of Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity to be a part of that there through your giving, so as you pray about that, be thinking about that, you can play a part of that there in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And then just a couple things we have coming up next week is our Christmas cantata. You have, again, another one of these little... Postcards, let me encourage you to invite somebody to come. Maybe share it with somebody that hasn't been here in a while. Uh, share it with a friend or a neighbor or a family member. Invite them to come and to be a part of that. You got a little bit of taste there this morning. The choir has been working hard. And uh, they're going to bless us next Sunday morning there in the, the uh, morning worship service. And so come be a part of that. Invite somebody else to come. Then uh, December 24th, there are Christmas Eve. We want to focus in on what the true meaning of Christmas is. As we look at what Jesus Christ has done for us, it's a candlelight Christmas Eve service, and so it's just a special kind of feeling as you come in here, and I think it'll help you to focus there on the true meaning of Christmas. So I want to invite you to come back after that, December 24th there at uh, 6 p.m., and then be praying for our postcards. I understand they've already hit some of our homes, and so be praying that God would use that there uh, to kind of to, to focus on the message of Jesus Christ, to invite people to come and to hear the gospel. And so be praying that we know that nothing of importance happens apart from prayer. And so uh, we're dependent upon God to move and to work. Uh, and so we're asking him to use these events and these tools that we're using. And so be praying there for those. Let me leave you with this blessing from Romans chapter 15 this morning. And it says, Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.
And I think that's possible because of Jesus Christ for us this morning. May God bless you. You are dismissed today. Thank you.